Hello everyone and thank you very much for joining us at our virtual pituitary conference. This event is part of our We Are Pituitary campaign celebrating all those involved within the pituitary community. This is one of our pre-recorded sessions and you can find the full programme and other session information linked in the video description. You can also visit our website pituitary.org.uk forward slash virtual conference to find out more. We are delighted to be offering this event for free, however, if you would like to make a contribution, you can do so online, by text or over the phone. Please feel free to chat in the comments or on our social media channels and any further questions you may have we will try to answer throughout the week or as soon after the event as we can. This morning we have Saurabh Sinha discussing pituitary surgery. He will be talking about the different types of pituitary surgery and when and how they are used. He is a consultant neurosurgeon based in Sheffield. He has been a member of our medical committee for many years and most recently has become a trustee with the foundation. Thank you very much, Saurabh, for putting together this presentation for us. Good morning. My name is Saurabh and I'm one of the consultant neurosurgeons from Sheffield. Uh, I'd like to thank the Pewter Foundation for inviting me to talk uh, today. Uh, I'd also like to thank all the people who've worked so hard to make this virtual conference such a success and to get it off the ground given all the difficulties that we have in not being allowed to have this conference in person. It's absolutely essential that um, I acknowledge all the staff uh, at both hospitals, uh, the Royal Hounshaw Hospital and the Sheffield Children's Hospital, because without their support, there's no way that I'd be able to do the work that uh, I do, and therefore this talk wouldn't exist. I guess the place to start is with where is the pituitary gland? Um, what we've got here is a person standing, uh, I guess in essence in profile, uh, looking towards the um, left of the screen and what we've done is we've taken a slice through their head uh, pretty much halfway through their nose. So what you should see is on the left hand side the nose uh, running up the forehead, the top of the head and at the um, right hand side of the screen the back of the head. Um, we then have uh, uh, the skull uh, which one can see underneath the skin and the two areas that I've labelled here are the frontal sinus, um, we can probably forget about that again now, uh, but more importantly the sphenoid sinus, which is, uh, as you can see, at the back of the nasal cavity. And that allows us a window towards our pituitary, which we've marked here in the pituitary foundation colours, therefore uh, purple uh, for the pituitary gland. And then the other structure that's very important to note is the optic chiasm which sits pretty much directly above the pituitary and is therefore a very important part of how patients might present as you'll see. Um, the brain uh, itself, uh, so the pituitary itself sorry sits underneath the back of the frontal lobe which is part of the cerebral hemisphere and then the rest of the brain up is made up of the brainstem and the cerebellum both of which are marked on the picture. If we now go on to uh, the MRI scan, which is hopefully in the same uh, orientation, you can see that those structures have been equally labelled. Um, and you can see again the, the pituitary in purple with a sphenoid sinus just in front and below it and the optic chiasm above it. The image on view now is called a coronal uh, scan. Um, the insert shows what a coronal scan uh, looks like. In essence, the patient is staring at you, almost as if you're looking at a mirror. So the head is coming out of the screen um, and the slice is taken so that part, the front of the face is in front of the slice and the back of the head is behind the slice, as you can see on that insert. The other thing to remember is because this patient is uh, looking at you from the other side, the left ear is on the right hand side of the screen and the right ear is on the left hand side of the image. Um, so kind of flipped around as, uh, from what you would expect. 
Here again, we've labelled our lovely pituitary in purple. You can see the arrow going towards it. In, and then directly above it, as we've already seen on the other views, is the optic chiasm. So you can see how if you were to have a tumour in the pituitary region that started to grow upwards, it would squash the nerve division and therefore cause a potential problem with that. If we magnify that area, then hopefully we can see some of the other very important structures here. Um, my wife was absolutely clear that it was unlikely that people would be experts at scans and therefore if I used a colour scheme, it might be much more helpful as we go on and look at different pictures. So the optic chiasm is going to be in white. The uh, purple pituitary is outlined as previous. Um, and then on either side of the pituitary gland, we have a structure called the cavernous sinus, which is outlined in blue. And this is a structure in which you really don't want to go because it's full of uh, a venous plexus of, full of blood, but it also houses the carotid artery. So again, on the right hand screen, the left carotid artery on the right hand screen, on the left hand screen, the um, right carotid artery. Um, and also, um, some of the cranial nerves. Now the cranial nerves here help to move the eye and the eyelid and the two lower uh, ones, uh, all of them are in yellow, um, help provide sensation to the majority of the face. So clearly this is an area into which you don't really want to stray from a surgical perspective. So what happens if you suddenly have a scan and told that you have a pituitary tumour? Well, first and foremost, most people panic because they're usually told that, not told that they've got a pituitary tumour, they're usually told that they've got a brain tumour. And clearly that conjures up all sorts of frightening uh, ideas. In actual fact, the majority of pituitary tumours are benign tumours and not cancerous. Um, and the majority of them could also be relatively managed or, or treated. Um, can you have cancer in the pituitary area? Yes, you can. It's uncommon, but we do see it in patients who have had uh, cancer elsewhere that has spread to other parts of the body, with the pituitary being one of the last, one of the very rare places that cancer spreads to. Uh, but it is incredibly uncommon. The pituitary gland is a really important structure in that it helps to organise all the hormonal function of really the rest of the body. Whilst the pituitary gland does produce some hormones that have uh, a direct effect on uh, your body, the main job is for it to tell other parts of the body to do their bits. Um, so, for example, uh, the pituitary gland will tell uh, the thyroid gland to produce uh, thyroxin or it will tell the adrenal gland to uh, produce cortisol. Um, and so when it doesn't work properly, it starts to create problems. Pituitary tumours, in essence, come in two flavours, those that produce uh, plenty of hormones and those that don't. Um, if we start with the functioning tumours, those that produce uh, excess uh, hormones and the commonest one that we're looking at is a prolactinoma and in these patients you can uh, produce um, milk or secretions from the breast uh, in women they may uh, stop having periods which we call amenorrhea and in men what you may find is that uh, they describe a loss of libido or poor erectile function um, Prolactinomas are pretty much managed medically. It, they respond very well to drugs such as cabergoline or uh, bromocryptine, and therefore there's a very small role for surgery here, predominantly in patients who have um, difficulties with the medication or in whom the medication just doesn't seem to be working. The pituitary can, uh, a pituitary tumour can produce too much uh, thyroid uh, stimulating hormones, so TSHOMA. These are pretty rare, um, but will give you the symptoms of having an overactive thyroid, which can make you quite manic. Uh, they can cause problems with your pulse, making it 
fast and irregular. It can make you quite hot and sweaty, even though it, it isn't outside. Um, again, um, surgery is an option here. Uh, medical treatment can also be used, but these are fairly rare tumours. And again, I'm not really going to talk too much um, more about that. Some of you may well have a pituitary tumour that's producing too much ACTH and gives us a condition called Cushing's disease. In Cushing's disease, uh, patients, uh, as can be seen in this adult picture on the left hand side, uh, end up with thinning and bruising of the skin. They can get weakness of their arms and legs, predominantly because they lose um, muscle power and muscle bulk. Um, they end up putting up a lot of weight in the centre of the, the, the body. Um, but then on top of that, more importantly, they have problems with high blood pressure and uh, diabetes, as well as uh, thinning of the bones, which we call osteoporosis. So clearly medical issues that really require us to treat Cushing's. It also occurs in children, although it's pretty rare. These are eight-year-old twins and the little girl here you can see has uh, Cushing's disease. Others of you may have a pituitary tumour that produces too much growth hormone and the condition here is called acromegaly. Um, growth hormone, as you can imagine, makes things grow. It doesn't just do that. But in acromegaly, what you can see is patients end up with much bigger hands and feet than they than would be expected. They can have an increase in size of their jaw and the nose. And so patients will may well complain of the fact that the rings don't fit their hands and they've had to maybe get them enlarged several times. Their shoes might be getting bigger and they need a bigger shoe size. This of course should have stopped when they stopped growing as, a, uh, as they started into early adulthood. And one of the other uh, main complaints that patients often have is they're very sweaty and they snore. That's usually a complaint from their partner rather than themselves. Again, medical issues that, that we worry about are acromegaly can cause problems with your uh, blood pressure, with diabetes and can actually make your heart much bigger. Um, and therefore, again, it's a condition that really needs treatment. Um, as before, it can affect children. It's pretty rare, but it does occur. This is a young boy who's only nine years old. We can already see how tall he is com in comparison with me. And when he was at school, aged four, he was already one of the tallest children in, in the school. Having discussed the, the functioning tumours, the, the tumours that don't produce hormones, as we call non-functioning adenomas, they actually make the bulk of the patients that we see from a surgical perspective. So at least three quarters of the patients that I've operated on have non-functioning tumours as opposed to functioning tumours. And the, the difficulty here is that some patients can have a non-functioning tumour and never know anything about it because it's not very big and it's not causing any trouble. As the tumour gets much bigger, however, it will start to interfere with the pituitary gland ability to function and will actually stop the pituitary gland from producing hormones and therefore none of the other uh, hormonal organs are going to work. And patients can then present with feeling tired, lethargic, um, in gentlemen, you can find that they don't shave as often, they don't have as much uh, secondary hair in all the places you'd expect and again uh, difficulties with loss of libido. In women you may well find that they stop having periods if they're of a, a appropriate age, uh, again a condition that we call amenorrhea. However, the commonest reason for operating on a non-functioning tumour uh, is due to uh, loss of vision. As we demonstrated in the scans earlier, the pituitary tumour sits directly below the optic chiasm and so any tumour that extends upwards to squash the chiasm will cause uh, visual loss, classically what's called a bitemporal hemianopia, which means that you can't see on either side. Many of you will have had your visual fields tested either at the hospital or an optician and this chart uh, gives an example of what result you might have. 
So as you can see on the uh, left hand uh, side of the screen uh, is uh, a area that's black and on the right hand side of the screen you can see the right half is black. That is loss of peripheral vision in both uh, these eyes giving you this classic bitemporal hemianopia appearance because of um, chiasmal compression. So we've got a tumour now. How are we going to approach this from a surgical perspective? The commonest uh, method that we use is called the transphenoidal approach. Uh, the um, original uh, anatomy pictures, I showed you the sphenoid sinus sitting at the back of the nasal cavity and how the pituitary sat at the upper uh, back end of it. And so you can see with the arrow that there's a very nice route from the nose through into the sphenoid sinus straight onto the uh, pituitary and pituitary fossa without actually having to uh, en encounter any brain up front. It's however not a new approach. Uh, this is a, a face mask of Tutankhamun. This is Komombo Temple which was built in 180 BC and it's one of the specialist medical temples and if we zoom in to the rock here you can actually see the brain hooks and brain curettes that the Egyptians used to use to go up through the nose to break the bottom of the skull and to whip out the brain through there in order to have the patient, the, the body prepared for uh, being mummified. So really something that has been happening for thousands of years. From a neurosurgical perspective, uh, pituitary tumours were done by going through the head. And we used to open the, the front of the head, go underneath the brain to find the tumour. Person who um, made it famous originally was Harvey Cushing, um, said to be the father of modern neurosurgery. Uh, and he moved from doing pituitary surgery through the head to uh, transphenoidally. Um, and because he was the one of the world leaders, the whole world moved with him. However, he had a significant number of deaths and about 50% of his patients died from infection, most likely meningitis. And therefore Harvey Cushing actually stopped doing transphenoidal surgery and went back to doing pituitary surgery through the head. And again, the whole world followed him. And actually that's where our story would have ended had it not been for this man. This is uh, Professor Norman Dot, who's a professor of neurosurgery from my hometown in Edinburgh. And he had worked with Harvey Cushing really liked the transphenoidal uh, approach and brought it back to Edinburgh where he uh, used uh, some lights so that he could see up the nose and by using that he was able to do 120 of these operations without a single death and so he helped to rejuvenate the approach and transphenoidal approach. So we, here we have uh, another one of these coronal scans uh, with a patient who has uh, visual loss. You can see on uh, the screen uh, on the uh, right hand side that I've outlined the pituitary tumour in purple and the optic chiasm in white. And you can see how the tumour is extending upwards to squash the chiasm and therefore give this patient uh, a visual problem and require surgery um, in order to uh, try and resolve this. The traditional and classical method would be using a microscope. You can see here how the uh, surgeon has a microscope passing light down through uh, the nose, usually via a speculum, and then can pass the instruments down the speculum, uh, guided by the microscope light to the tumour in order to remove it. Now we can see after surgical treatment, again on the right hand side, so the, on the left we've got uh, the tumour beforehand, on the right you can see how the, the tumour has been removed and the purple outline now really is probably just what's left of the gland, but the chiasm is now in a much more normal position and is much more much thicker in calibre, suggesting that we've decompressed it and hopefully restored vision to normal. As you can see from uh, the microscope picture that we that I showed, um, the microscope only provides light from the outside and therefore can only really travel 
in a straight line down the speculum in the nose. What happens if your tumour now is not just in front of you, but extends not just upwards to squash the chiasm, but also out towards the side? So in this case, we can see we the uh, purple outline tumour not only extends upwards to squash the chiasm. Again, we can see in white, it's smaller calibre and being squashed, but it's also extending out into the left-hand uh, side, uh, into the cavernous sinus. And if you remember, this is where we not only see the left carotid artery, but we also see the nerves that uh, help to move the eye. And so this patient will have problems with either double vision or possibly with uh, a droopy eyelid. And this is where we find the benefit of uh, using an endoscope. So having done transphenoidal surgery for over 100 years and using the microscope for the best part of the last um, 50, um, the endoscope probably is the first of the big new variations on a theme. Uh, endoscopy is not new to medicine. Uh, it's been used a lot predominantly by the general surgeons, gynaecologists and urologists. And many of you will have heard of or have had friends who've had a laparoscopic cholecystectomy where the endoscope is uh, put into the tummy to help remove a gallbladder through what we would call keyhole surgery. The advantage the endoscope has is it's uh, a tube which has its camera and light at the end. So whereas with a microscope, the light is coming from behind or behind the hands of the surgeon, in this case, the light and camera are right up against uh, where you want to be. So in this case, uh, the pituitary tumor, um, and therefore gives us a much better uh, view. The other advantage that the endoscope has is not only do you get endoscopes that have a camera on the end, what we call zero degree, you can have the uh, various angles on the endoscope. So in actual fact, you can look around corners, you can look upwards, you can look down, and it actually opens the whole of the skull base from right at the front of the bottom of the skull, as you can see with the blue endoscope, all the way down to the top of the spine that you can see with the purple endoscope. Um, and we can therefore remove any uh, pathology in this area endoscopically through the nose. So in our patient here, you can see on the right hand side that the chiasm has now been decompressed and uh, it has regained its normal cal caliber. Um, there is uh, no purple uh, outline here because actually all you can see here now is a uh, blood hematoma from the surgery uh, that's replaced uh, the tumor that was there and there and and this has all been done by the benefit of being able to look around the corner with the endoscope so that we're not missing any tumor. Whilst the majority of patients uh, present through clinic um, some patients do present as an emergency. And this is usually because of a condition called pituitary apoplexy or pituitary tumor apoplexy. Um, this is a condition where the patients will develop sudden onset, really bad headache. They may be associated with visual loss. They usually feel absolutely dreadful. And in some cases, they may also have double vision uh, because their eyes don't move like they should do or even might have drooping of the eyelid. And the reason this occurs is because they may or may not know that they've got a pituitary tumour, but the pituitary tumour has had a stroke-like event. And when we talk about stroke, it's not the patient or the brain that's had the stroke, it's the tumour. And what's happened is either there's been a significant bleed into it or for whatever reason there has the blood supply has suddenly stopped coming to it and the tumour has therefore had the equivalent of a stroke. And this means that the tumour suddenly expands and swells and in doing so it can squash the structures around it. So as you may remember from earlier on, if it, if it swells upwards, it's going to squash the nerves to vision and cause a problem with visual loss. If it swells rapidly to the sides, 
it will squash the nerves that help move the eyes and the eyelid, hence the fact that we get double vision or a droopy eyelid. The issue here is that this is actually a medical emergency. And the reason is, is because the normal pituitary gland now has been very squashed and is therefore not functioning. And in doing so, the patient actually needs to be covered with high dose steroids and usually some fluids as well, because there'll be a problem with their salt and water balance. The, the, it's, these patients that therefore usually get admitted acutely to hospital and are managed medically. And then once they are medically stable, we may then need to think about surgery. This is a, a gentleman who presented with a sudden onset headache and uh, feeling rubbish. He had a significant uh, impact on his vision, such that his visual acuity, so his ability to see distance, was very poor, and he had a, a bitemporal hemianopia. He also had some difficulties with moving his right eye with some uh, drooping of the right eyelid. And as you can see on this scan, the uh, tumour again outlined in purple is extending upwards to squash the white optic chiasm, but it's also extending towards the right hand side. Remember again, this is on the left hand side of the screen, the right hand side into the cavernous sinus there and squashing those nerves that we talked about previously that help move the eye and control the eyelid. So having admitted him, as we've discussed earlier, uh, and treated him uh, as a medical emergency with fluids and extra steroids, we were then thinking that he was well enough for us to do surgery. But when we came round to it, about 48 hours after his admission, he told us that his vision was much better. And therefore, we continued to manage him medically. And a few weeks later, we did a scan, which you can now see on the uh, right hand side of the slide, which shows that the tumour has pretty much disappeared on its own, predominantly because this is uh, hemorrhage or, or um, stroke-like material, and therefore it, it dies and shrinks. And the nerves to vision you can see are now back to normal thickness. And actual fact here, they've actually dropped down into the space where the pituitary tumour was, and his vision is completely returned to normal without needing any surgical intervention. However, sometimes patients' uh, uh, vision doesn't get better uh, after the medical management, and in those cases, surgery may be required. Um, this is a, a young lady who also presented with pituitary apoplexy. She was also managed in the acute phases to make sure that we made sure she had enough fluids and um, steroids on board. Um, and what you can see here in, in the scans is something that looks like a snowman, um, both on the, um, the coronal view and that profile sagittal view. And the nerves division are being squashed at the top of the snowman. In fact, they're so squashed, I can't even put a white line to show you where they might be. And this is all blood. And so this patient did need to go to theatre to have an operation. Now, I promised that if I was going to show videos in case anybody was squeamish and didn't want to see them, that I would warn you. So um, the next slide is going to be a video uh, of an operation. If you feel like closing your eyes, be my guest. I will uh, reassure you when the video has uh, finished. So what we have here is us inside the uh, sphenoid into the cella. We've already taken bone of the pituitary. Now the knife is going through the lining of the pituitary, the dura, and you can see blood has come out under quite high pressure and explains why patients have such bad headache and feel so rotten. Okay, video is finished. Those of you who uh, had closed your eyes can open them again. Um, so we can see now the scan of the patient having had that operation. So on the left, we've got that uh, snowman full of blood and impossible to see the chiasm, it's so squashed. And now on the right hand side, I've managed to fill in in white where the optic chiasm is, and you can see it's got back to its normal caliber and position. And what's left of any pituitary tissue uh, is there down in purple and back to its normal position again. So a good result from uh, that surgery. 
One of the other uh, interesting features about pituitary apoplexy is the difference that we found in adults and children. Uh, whereas maybe only one in 10 of the patients that have presented acutely to uh, our unit with pituitary apoplexy have gone on to need surgery. Um, we found that when we've had children with uh, pituitary apoplexy, their uh, condition is such that they've all ended up needing surgery uh, because of compromise to their vision. So that's a so it suggests that pituitary apoplexy in adult in in children is much more aggressive than it is in adults, but I don't entirely know why. Whilst adults with with non-function tumours uh, have an easy way of presenting, either with hypertrism or um, visual loss, it's a lot more subtle in children. And one of the first things that children with pituitary tumours have is a decrease in uh, their actual growth. Um, one of the difficulties here is children are all different shapes and sizes. As you can see from the three children uh, in the photo here, their uh, picture has been uh, reproduced with permission from their from them and their parents. Um, but all three have got pituitary tumours. So how do you know that they're not growing as well as they should do? Well, it can be quite difficult and often means that it takes us longer to pick up the pituitary problem in a child. It does, however, help if you have a twin. This, these twins, as you can see, are identical at birth, remained identical uh, when they were about two. But here at four years old, the, this young man is now slightly stockier than his brother. He's actually not as tall, although you can't tell because of the angle of the picture. And he doesn't have as much energy as his brother. And because he's got an identical twin and they've been the same, this allowed mum and dad to pick up very early on that there was a problem with one of their children. And rather than a delay of several months or even several years before a problem was picked up, we actually picked, they actually picked up that there was a problem with their child. And within three months of that, he had a diagnosis of an abnormality in his pituitary, which we've then gone on to deal with. Uh, the other difficulties with uh, children is the anatomy. Whereas in uh, adults, we have this beautiful sphenoid sinus, which allows us very good entry towards a, a pituitary uh, tumour. In children, the sphenoid sinus isn't very well developed until they're much older. And therefore, you can see that it's not easily an approach that one can use for pituitary tumours in small children. Here's an example of a young man who has a um, pituitary region tumour. This is actually a craniopharyngioma. And you can see from uh, that he's quite a young man and his sphenoid sinus is very small. And it's going to be very difficult to deliver uh, a tumour through that sphenoid sinus. And equally, the, the, this tumour is likely to be quite calcified and therefore actually bringing out big pieces of what in essence are uh, calcium rocks is going to be very difficult through the nose and therefore we have to think of another approach. Uh, and so rather than going up through the nose, what we've done in this child's case, we've opened his head, we've opened his head by going through his eyebrow and that's allowed us to uh, take a trapdoor of bone away here, get underneath the brain and attack the tumour in the same way that Harvey Cushing would have done all those years ago. Fortunately for both patients and surgeons alike, pituitary tumours, pituitary tumour surgery is usually pretty um, successful with uh, little in the way of complications. However, uh, we need to be open and honest and be clear that actually complications can occur. Anybody who has a general anaesthetic has a risk of a clot in the legs or a clot in the lungs, a chest infection or even the small possibility of a heart attack. But this is the same for any general anaesthetic procedure. However, from a pituitary perspective itself, the surgery carries risks to the structures that in, are in and around the pituitary gland. So on the left picture here, the red arrows are pointing to carotid arteries, which you can see are intimately associated with this pituitary tumour. And in fact, in this case, the carotid artery on the left hand side actually runs through the tumour and therefore at significant risk of being damaged by surgery. The risks here therefore are risk of bleeding. That risk of bleeding can lead to a stroke, 
uh, and paralysis on one side or the other, and even a small risk to your life. The white arrow above the pituitary is uh, pointing to the nerves to vision. And so clearly you can see how close that is to the top of the pituitary tumour. And if we were to go past that and break the roof of the pituitary, then it's entirely possible that we can damage the nerves to vision and leave the patient with worsening vision than they had beforehand. This picture here shows another blood vessel which is behind the back of uh, the pituitary gland and tumour. Usually there's a very thin piece of bone here that protects us from this blood vessel called the basilar artery, but in some cases that bone may be thin or even missing, and so the basilar artery can be damaged, and again there's a risk there for bleeding, of stroke, or a small risk to your life. Fortunately, vascular nerve injuries from pituitary surgery are pretty rare. The roof of the pituitary gland is a very thin structure called the diaphragma, and it it is e it can be easily damaged at surgery, leading to leakage of uh, brain fluid, uh, which we call CSF, um, that can then drip down into and out of the nose. And whilst many people say, well, nasal drip doesn't bother me too much, what we've left here is an opening for uh, bugs to get in and the opening all the way into the brain, leading to an infection called meningitis. Clearly the uh, idea of meningitis scares people and they think of uh, the horror stories you hear on the news of babies who uh, have not made it to hospital. But the meningitis that, that one gets after pituitary surgery, whilst similar, is not as severe and is um, can be managed with uh, antibiotics in hospital. And sometimes you need to do a procedure to stop, uh, to block the hole that has been created. So clearly this was an issue that made Harvey Cushing stop doing uh, transphenoidal surgery for pituitary tumours because of all the infections that he was getting. So what have we learned and what is the, a new technique that we can use to try and uh, improve on this? And the method that we've started to use are vascularised flaps. Again, this isn't a new technique in the grand scheme of things, plastic surgeons have been using vascularized flaps for many years for all sorts of operations. But here for pituitary surgery, we can take a uh, tissue off the nasal septum, as you can see from the uh, dotted square, uh, and all of that is being supplied by blood. Um, and therefore, when we rotate this um, uh, piece of tissue over the defect, we know that it should heal nicely because it's still got some blood supply and it should plug the holes that were causing Harvey Cushing all those troubles all those years ago. As I mentioned at the beginning, you can't do this without a great team around you and we're very lucky in Sheffield to have an excellent uh, theatre team. This is just really just one small part of it. Um, we've got from left to right, we've got Stefan, our anaesthetist, we've got Rob, the ODP, who helps Stefan to put the patients to sleep and monitor them during the operation. Uh, there's me, uh, then there's Emma, who's uh, one of our excellent uh, scrub nurses. Uh, she's very good at keeping us uh, in check and making sure that we're doing things right. Uh, Shokat Mirza, my ENT uh, surgeon and colleague, and uh, Tracy, who's our circulator, whose job is to go and find all the instruments urgently that we've forgotten to tell Emma about at the beginning of the operation and find ourselves suddenly in need. The combination of uh, ENT and neurosurgery has certainly developed for endoscopic pituitary and skull based surgery. And we were very fortunate in Sheffield that um, uh, we had Shokat Mirza available to to join me and we've certainly found that over the years that two heads are better than one and that we've been able therefore to deal endoscopically with some very complex cases in both adults and children that we probably wouldn't have been able to do uh, on our own. The uh, skull base flap that you saw uh, earlier on is something that has been uh, championed by ENT surgeons and uh, Shokat reminds me that every time I cause a CSF leak it's his uh, wonderful skills that allow us to build a flap and patch up all the damage that I've actually done. Apart from uh, damaging the uh, neurovascular structures that we've just uh, discussed, 
you can actually damage the normal pituitary gland itself and this can either be temporary or permanent and one of the ones that uh, some of you may well have experienced is a condition called diabetes insipidus. This occurs when there's damage to the posterior pituitary gland uh, or the stock uh, at surgery and leads to patients uh, becoming incredibly thirsty and needing to pee buckets both day and night uh, and can be really quite an unpleasant uh, experience and therefore needs uh, some form of treatment. And this is where again we as surgeons look for help and we can't do any of this work without the amazing input from my endocrine colleagues. So on the top row there uh, these are my paediatric endocrine colleagues and on the bottom row some of you may recognize uh, the endocrine consultants uh, who help to deal with the problems that I've created from a hormonal perspective without whom again I couldn't do surgery and actually many of you wouldn't be as well as you are in the audience here. But we don't just cause problems with uh, diabetes insipidus. One of the issues with doing pituitary surgery on, on any tumours, we can actually damage the normal anterior gland too, and patients can develop hypopituitarism with um, all the problems I, we mentioned, I mentioned at the beginning with a, non, a large non-functioning tumour, um, and need, and therefore they need to be properly assessed uh, around the time of surgery and certainly down the line to ensure that any hormonal deficit is being replaced. And so once more, uh, indebted to a whole bunch of people who allow me to do these cases and then look after patients afterwards. And these are our endocrine nurses. Uh, clearly two of my endocrine colleagues have managed to squeeze into this photo. But most of you will have, and if you don't, I thoroughly recommend you find and get in touch with your local endocrine nurses because they are amazing and they uh, provide excellent support, excellent help, but equally they are the ones who check the bloods in, in our unit at two weeks and six weeks down the line to make sure that the pituitary is working and if it's not working, uh, flag it up in front of us so that we can then correct the appropriate deficits. So again, uh, as I said at the beginning, this is a team effort. So what other um, things that can we do to move forward to help us with pituitary surgery? Well, this is a young girl that we looked after at Children's Hospital. She's got acromegaly uh, because of this tiny little tumour here. Now, when you do an operation and you open the pituitary gland, sometimes it's very obvious what's tumour and sometimes it's not so obvious. So one of the great advantages we have at the Children's Hospital if we ha is we have an intraoperative MRI scanner. So in this case, we've operated on the patient and then having completed what we think is the operation, we can then wheel them on, their op on the operative trolley whilst they're still asleep into the room next door where the MRI scanner is situated, co-located with our operative theatre and actually put the patient straight into the MRI scanner while they're asleep and have a look and see what we've done. Again, can't do this without help. This is uh, Dan Conley. He is one of our neuroradiologists. He works both uh, in adults and children and has been uh, an amazing help in ensuring that we are able to know whether we've completed the operation or not. And so here is a scan. Uh, you can see where the tumour used to be. It's now been completely replaced by blood. And our, my radiology colleague is very happy to tell me that I've been in the right place and he can't see any tumour. And therefore we can happily finish that operation knowing we've done exactly what we wanted to do. Surgeons love operating. I love pituitary surgery. But is it necessarily the right thing for our patients? There are various other manage, methods of managing uh, patients with pituitary tumours and we therefore have to have a setup that allows that. In Sheffield as in many other uh, units we have what's called a multidisciplinary team meeting where members of the endocrinologists, the radiologists, surgeons and other teams will meet to try and discuss patients and how best to manage them. 
The entire linchpin in Sheffield and probably in other units is the MDT coordinator. And this is Helen, who is our MDT coordinator in Sheffield. And she is a reason why our setup works so well. She works really hard in order to make sure she gets all the patient details, all the test results and all the scans so that when we are discussing patients or when we're speaking to them in clinic, we have all the right information. And she is absolutely essential to us making the right decisions. So for example, here's a patient who has a very large tumour, their vision is very poor. Of course, the surgeon is very excited because this is a nice big lump for him to take out and make better. But actually, Helen's done all the background work for this and this patient has a prolactin that's incredibly high and the best management here isn't surgery, but is actually starting them on uh, medication for their uh, uh, prolactinoma. And sure enough, within uh, a matter of weeks, the tumour is less than half the size without any of the potential risks of surgery. And clearly this is the best management for the uh, patient, regardless of what the surgeon thinks. So apart from surgical and medical uh, treatments, what other options do we have? Well, radiotherapy is a very well recognized treatment for tumors, although clearly we use have a tendency to use them more for malignant and aggressive tumours, but they still have a role to play in some benign tumours. And that's one of the things that we can do for pituitary tumours. Um, and here we've got a picture of uh, our uh, pituitary oncologist. This is uh, Lynn. She wouldn't give me a professional photo and only wanted us to have a photo of her diving, predominantly because a mask covers her face. So here we are. Um, the the aim of radiotherapy is to provide um, radiation to the abnormal tissue, uh, i.e. the pituitary tissue, whilst uh, not delivering much radiation to the surrounding area. And therefore you can give this on a daily basis, Monday to Friday for a few weeks, with the hope and expectation that the normal brain will recover in between uh, radiation uh, doses or fractions as they're called, whereas the tumour will uh, continue to be hit and therefore slow it down if not shrink it entirely. But apart from conventional radiotherapy, we also have the option of using a more modern uh, type of radiotherapy called uh, radiosurgery. Uh, and this uh, is something that we in Sheffield are uh, very fortunate to uh, have. The Gamma Knife Radiosurgery Unit in Sheffield has been present since 1985 and therefore has more than 35 years of experience. Um, it was the first in the UK and remains the largest uh, and is actually in fact one of, the one of the three or four largest in the whole of the world. Gamma Knife Radiosurgery uses um, 192 beams of, uh, radi of small dose radiation which together, when they coalesce in the one point, uh, give a large dose of radiation to a small area, in this case, into our pituitary tumour. The advantages it has is it clearly doesn't require surgery, despite the word knife in the um, title, um, and therefore there are none of the risks uh, from a surgical procedure. However, in order not to damage uh, the rest of the brain with uh, beams of radiation, the target can only be less than three centimetres. And it also has to be away from very sensitive parts of the brain as the radiation spill will potentially damage them. So here again, we can see this um, uh, scan that we've seen several times through the talk. Um, I uh, hopefully now you recognize that the purple line is covering the pituitary tumor, the red is the carotid artery, the white is the optic chasm which is being squashed here on the left hand side. And this tumor is more than three centimeters in size and therefore uh, is not suitable for stereotactic radiosurgery. The other issue with it is it's the tumor is intimately associated with the optic chiasm and therefore there is no gap and the, the chiasm is therefore at risk of damage from the radiation that you might give. 
Not only that, if one looks at the picture on the right hand side, um, you can see as before that the tumour is extending into the, the left hand side in the cavernous sinus as we've discussed before, but the back of the tumour is incredibly close to and uh, touching the brainstem. And this too is a very sensitive structure and therefore uh, any radiation overspill will damage the brainstem with long term complications for patients. So the, again, that location um, is prevents a radio surgery from being an option in this case. This is a much more appropriate tumour uh, for a gamma knife. You can see the tumour is small. It doesn't actually go anywhere near the optic chasm. So actually there isn't necessarily a big role for surgery here, but the patient's quite troubled because the tumour is extending beyond the carotid artery, which circled in red, into the cavernous sinus and is squashing the nerves that move the eye, giving him double vision. So surgery could be done here, but there's a real risk to that carotid artery. And rather than take the, that risk, what one can do is to just give gamma knife to that area, safe in the knowledge that we are well away from the optic chiasm, the tumour is less than three centimetres, and we should therefore be able to reduce the size of this tumour without causing any harm to any of the important structures. Clearly, there is a risk to the uh, normal pituitary gland, which is sitting to the to the left of this, as um, uh, and the therefore there is a risk that the patient will develop hyperpituitarism sometime over the next uh, few years, even up to twenty years down the line. Um, but it it's uh, a much smaller risk than a surgical procedure would be in this area, and hence. Um, these are the sorts of patients that we would refer for gamma knife radio surgery. I hope that so far I've managed to provide for you an overview of um, the aims of pituitary surgeries, the why and the how, uh, also how we minimize complications using these new flaps uh, as well as um, endoscopy and its role in uh, dealing with more complicated tumors and also some of the more new imaging techniques such as intraoperative MRI scan which allows us to maximize resection and then finally uh, not only using uh, conventional uh, radiation treatments but the more modern uh, versions in the form of radiosurgery. I, I, because I've not been able to uh, give this talk in person I, I'm not really able to take questions uh, and so uh, I have um, got the last and, and my favourite and specialist of all specialists to try and come up with uh, some common questions that uh, patients might ask or want answered. How many days in hospital when can I work with all these online meetings happening uh, from home? Uh, my little boy is very keen on uh, being involved. So my thanks to Rory for uh, his beautiful signing and asking pretty much two of the most common questions uh, that I normally get asked. So the first one, how many days in hospital? Um, to a large extent really depends on how your hospital is set up. Uh, in Sheffield we are able to arrange pre-op assessments for most of our patients so that they can actually come in on the day of surgery um, and unless they have Cushing's and possibly acromegaly there's a pretty good chance we'll send them home the next day if they're well enough. Um, clearly if they're not well enough there are any complications we'd keep them in for longer but the majority of our patients now are able to go home the day after surgery. Patients with Cushing's often end up staying in for a couple of days longer uh, because we want to uh, make sure that their cholesterol levels are low enough that we've uh, done uh, the job that we came in to do uh, because if we haven't we may uh, take them back for a further operation in order to try and get their Cushing's into remission. Um, the second question, uh, when can they go back to work? For the majority of people having pituitary surgery, most of them feel that they are pretty much back to a, a state where they can go back to work about six weeks down the line. Um, 
Again, Cushing's patients often uh, aren't in that category. They often feel pretty um, rubbish, uh, whether or not they're in remission. Uh, and I think they, they often take longer. I have had patients over the years who, um, e even at six weeks, didn't feel ready for work and, and, and maybe off for three months or even longer. But equally, I have had some patients who felt so much better having had surgery or actually more likely that their um, endocrine um, treatment made them feel better, uh, who were ready to go back to work after two or three weeks. Um, so it really does depend on the individual and the underlying uh, condition. I think for the surgeon, it's really important to understand that the patient's journey uh, doesn't begin and end with pituitary surgery. Oh God, at least I hope it doesn't end with um, pituitary surgery, otherwise I really am doing something wrong. Um, but this is just a small part of the overall management. And uh, to a large extent, the uh, endocrinologists, my colleagues that you can see um, both from the children's and the adults, really are the uh, mainstay of um, management of, of the patients. But it's really important to remember that there are lots of other people who are also involved and I hope I've acknowledged some if not all of them uh, during this talk. You know we need input from our uh, oncologists and our radiologists uh, as well as um, other members of the pituitary MDT. You can see here uh, when we dial in online that we can have our regional endocrinologists, not just from our hospital, but from the surrounding areas, as well as the pathologist and possibly even the ophthalmologist and the radio surgeons who can all um, dial in as well to provide uh, support and advice. And, you know, Despite all these amazing uh, doctors, I have to say uh, with no apology whatsoever, that actually for me, the most important uh, members of the team here are the endocrine nurses that you can see slap bang in the middle of this slide and Helen, our pituitary MDT coordinator, without whom actually none of our activity in Sheffield and I guess probably for most pituitary uh, teams up and down the country really just wouldn't function uh, as well. And so in summary, I think it's really important to recognise that actually it's, it's not about your pituitary surgeon, but it's about having the optimal or perfect pituitary service, which can uh, collect in from all these different specialties, not just locally, but regionally, and make sure that there's good communication between all these groups to ensure that what we're doing is keeping you at the centre of everything we do and looking after you to the best of our ability. Thank you all very much for listening. I hope that's been helpful. Um, I um, am happy to accept any questions uh, through uh, uh, Pat um, or any other members of the Pituitary Foundation and I'm happy to reply uh, whenever I can. And thanks again to the Pituitary Foundation uh, and all those people who've done all the hard work uh, to make this event such a success. Thank you very much.